So next, a not animal story, but involving animals, about dead languages. Please welcome to the stage, Ray Robitai with Vanishing Voices, Unwrapping Languages of the Past. I too have been instructed to pick up a poop on the way out. <clears throat> A little higher? You are strong, Isolde. <clears throat> Imagine yourself on the Andamanese Islands off the eastern coast of India. If you're picturing a tropical beverage with a cocktail umbrella, you need to recalibrate. This ain't that kind of island. I know. There's a bar over there, though. On this island, some of the locals are known to welcome, welcome, outsiders with bows and arrows. But luckily for us, we've found a welcoming village. The village is small. There are children running around yelling playfully in Hindi. Hindi is the language that they inherited from India when it took over the islands a while back. And you want to learn more about the village, so you approach one of the elders. Her name is Boa Senior. And she tells you the story of her people, the Bow Tribe, one of several that fit into the great Andamanese tribal families. She tells you how their population went from over 5,000 to only about 50 surviving today. Most of them were killed off from diseases brought to the islands by the British during their colonization. And Boa Senior is telling you this story in Hindi as well, but for her, Hindi is a secondary language. Her mother tongue, Akabo, is rich with nuanced descriptions of words describing the flora and fauna of these islands and their relationship to humans. These words don't exist in Hindi or English or any other language for that matter. They are unique to Akabo. But she never tells her story in Akabo because no one on the islands learns that language anymore. For the past four decades, Boa Senior has been the only surviving speaker of the language Akabo. But she's certainly not the only one to face that lonely existence. There are over 7,000 languages spoken in the world today, and about half of them will disappear before the end of this century. Languages die off for a variety of reasons. Often, they're replaced with another language that's more economically useful. During times of frequent colonization, people would be taunted or even punished for speaking their native language. And so people lost their pride in their language. And as they stopped speaking it, those speakers that remained went out of practice. And eventually, the language dwindles, and eventually, it goes extinct. And when a language dies, it takes a piece of the culture with it. But what if we were able to bring a language back? Tonight, I'll tell you the story of several zombie languages that have returned after extinction. We start. <laughs> Science. <laughs> we start with Alexander von Humboldt, a storied adventurer who's popped up in several Odd Salon presentations. He would travel across the globe collecting data and samples to bring back to the scientific community at home. And he'd take thorough notes on the people and cultures that he encountered on his journeys. Around the year 1800, his travels took him to the Orinoco River in a region that's part of modern day Venezuela. It was there that he met and stayed with the Carib tribe. Now the Carib had lots of pet parrots, but Humboldt astutely noted that one of those parrots didn't speak the same language as the others. The Carib explained there had been a neighboring tribe, the Maypores, and there had been a rivalry between the Carib and the Maypores that had turned fatal several years earlier. The Carib had wiped them off their land and wiped out their clan entirely. The only thing that remained was the parrot. And now this parrot was the only surviving speaker of the Maypore language. <laughs> Now, Maypore, like many tribal languages, had never been written down, so Humboldt had the foresight to transcribe about 40 words from the parrot's vocabulary into his journal. Some of those you can see here. 
And thus, he saved this language from oblivion. In fact, you can even hear Maypore spoken today, albeit not by humans, and not by Humboldt's parrot. Of course, it's long since died off. But the story of this parrot that was the sole survivor of this lost language so captivated contemporary artist Rachel Berwick that she acquired several of her own parrots and taught them to speak the Maypore language using Humboldt's transcriptions as a guide. And so the Maypore language has come back from the dead, our first zombie language. But not all languages have someone to look out for their legacy in this way. And before I get into the next one, I need to take a brief detour that I'm going to call those wacky Victorians. You see, the Victorians had quite a few hobbies that one might consider curious or even a bit grotesque by today's standards. Probably warrants its own talk, but for tonight, I'd like to draw your attention to their penchant for unwrapping mummies. You see, if you happen to have enough money to import your very own mummy, not only would you do so, but you'd arrange a festivity around it and invite all of your friends over to watch while you unveiled your centerpiece. And so it was actually in keeping with the times that when a certain government official retired and decided to travel through Alexandria, Egypt, he picked up the perfect souvenir. A sarcophagus containing a female mummy. He takes it home, sets it up in his parlor. What better way to welcome guests than with a dead Egyptian? and all is well for several years until he passes away and his brother inherits the mummy. Now his brother is a priest from Slovenia who I suppose had more conservative tastes. He puts the mummy in storage and a few years later he donates it to the museum that would eventually become the Archaeological Museum of Zagreb. Now up until this point the mummy has been a fun party prop, a novel inheritance, but it's not until it arrives at the museum that they realize there are writings on the mummy's linen wrappings, and they're assumed to be hieroglyphs. About a decade later, somebody from the museum realizes they are not hieroglyphs after all. Instead, it's a transliteration of the Egyptian Book of the Dead into Arabic. Except no, because more than a decade later, a language expert examines the mummy, and at first believes the language to be Coptic, but eventually realizes the language is Etruscan. This is the second language that comes back to us from the dead, or on the dead, or wrapped around the dead, whatever preposition is appropriate for a language, you know, wrapped around a dead body. Now, I'm just curious if anybody has heard of the Etruscans before tonight's talk, just yell out something that they've invented. <laughs> Hurrah! In fact, there are a few things that we know about the Etruscans. We know that they introduced winemaking to the French, critical. They invented the concept of the toga, for better or worse on that one. Perhaps most importantly, they laid the foundation for what is the modern day alphabet in English and many other languages. Now, one of the reasons we don't know too much about the Etruscan culture is that not too many of their written artifacts have survived. In fact, the mummy's linen wrappings are the longest preserved text in Etruscan that we have. It's believed to be a religious calendar. But frankly, the Etruscans date back to 250 BC, so literally for centuries, this thing went unnoticed. And then once it was discovered for 30 more years, it was misinterpreted. So. I don't know how much credit I'm giving the current interpretation. And I know what you're thinking. If only the mummy had also been a pirate, because then the pirate may have had a pet parrot, and an early explorer could have just happened to stumble across that parrot and find its language so novel that he records it in his journal, and the language will live on forever. It's a little far-fetched, isn't it? In fact, even the story of the Maypore-speaking parrots is most likely a legend. Humboldt did 
uh, transcribe the phonetics of various languages that he encountered in South America. And he does have a story in his journals about a parrot speaking an unfamiliar language, but these accounts don't seem to be related. So actually, we don't know what language Rachel Berwick's parrots are speaking. And in a sense, the Maypori language is somewhat like that Etruscan text. For thousands of years, they're overlooked. And then when they're finally discovered, their meaning is distorted. This, I think, is the saddest part of a language going extinct. Not only does the voice vanish, but the words get rewritten over time. You remember Boa Senior from the Andamanese Islands? She died in 2010. And with her passing, the Akabo language died as well. I know I'm kind of a bummer tonight. It's a good thing there's booze. Keep drinking. And as I researched this topic, I was pretty bummed out because I kept coming across dozens of stories of languages and tribes that had been lost. But I also came across some inspiring tales of languages that had been brought back not by parrots and mummies, although I do love a good zombie-speaking parrot, but by people, by the descendants whose great-great-grandparents spoke a language they themselves don't understand, and they are so compelled to connect with their ancestors that they seek the language out, and they practice it, and they learn how to pronounce it, and most importantly, they learn the stories of their people the stories of their heritage, and they start sharing those stories with each other, and they do so with pride. That is how you bring a language back. And I believe the story of Boa Senior is also one of hope. In her case, a linguist, Professor Anvita Abi, cared enough about the Andamanese languages that she spent six years on those islands, encouraging the locals to speak in their tribal tongue and recording them as they told their stories. So Boa Senior did have a chance to tell her story after all, in her own words. So in lieu of a toast, I'd like to give you the opportunity to hear some of Boa Senior's story. This is another language that is brought back to us after its death, but this time from the original source. These are perhaps the last words spoken in the Akabo language. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Humans, we're turning it around. For our next segment, I would like to talk about Adventure Harvey, who is our mascot. Uh, tonight we have a themed Wolpertinger, the Harvmento Mori, uh, to commemorate extinct things. I believe they are all gone, they are, they are extinct. But you have a chance to win this one. I'll talk about that in a moment. So we're compiling a project of all the places that uh, our community and uh, our Wolpertingers have traveled to together called Adventure Harvey. And you can participate if you, if you win or obtain a Harvey through other methods. Uh, you can travel and use the hashtag Adventure Harvey to let us know where you've been. So Harvey's had a very busy last couple weeks. He survived the dreary exodus. <laughs> In Oklahoma, he performed his civic duty and voted. He was granted security clearance to work at NASA for the day. He visited the gates of hell in Philadelphia. He was imperiled by winds in Yosemite. And I'm very pleased to introduce one of our friends uh, to Harvey Wolpertinger as a namesake for her new Rex bunny. This is Harvey Wolpertinger Waffles Rex, who is a very handsome bunny. Again, uh, tonight's theme Harvey is uh, Extinction Harvey, and they're all sold out at the merch table, but you know what? You can win one in the raffle. I understand we, run, we, ran, out of uh, we ran out of raffle, I almost said waffle strips, which would be amazing. <laughs> we ran out of raffle strips at the door, but there are more at the merch table, so if you did not get a chance to enter, you can do so at intermission. Also, while you do so, please check out our merch table. Uh, the money we make through merch helps us keep going and uh, keep our speakers in drink, which is very important. 
Uh, so your, your purchase of a Wolpertinger glass or our Harvey Classic uh, helps keep us going. Now, after the break, we are going to have a brief history of sound recording and the technologies that fell by the wayside, uh, the fishy mystery of the coelacanth, and the much misunderstood Tasmanian tiger. So again, during the uh, intermission, please talk to our speakers. Talk to me. I'll bring some of my art out from upstairs, and I'll, just, I'll talk to you about extinction stories because I have a billion animal stories I want to share because they're so ridiculous. Um, and also, our drink special tonight is the dodo, which has notes of mint, and the last chance, which is a grapefruit cocktail. They sound delicious. Uh, please have one and report back. And we'll see you in about 15 minutes.